conference this year, Francis. Would, would you mind sharing with the community a little bit about yourself? Great. Well, I'm 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 based uh, here in London. I write about food and wine for a wine magazine, uh, the World of Fine Wine, and it's it's self consciously I think it's it's the it's the wine magazine for geeks. It's big, thick. It's quarterly. We are entirely long form, so the, the minimum article length for a piece is two and a half thousand words. It's the only magazine in the world, I think, which would allow me to print a 20,000 word article about formation of taste, about, about why we like the things that we like. Yeah. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real privilege to write for, and it's, it's a great chance really to to ask questions. I, I, I'm, I'm constantly delighted to do something that allows me to meet people who are doing interesting things and ask them questions about why they do what they do. Yeah. Uh, and then to string together the, the connections. So because I operate across wine, across food, and not, not just across food, I, 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 I have a, a book coming out that I wrote in, uh, with my, my wife, Bronwyn, uh, Reinventing the Wheel, which is about the, the history, the science, the future of uh, dairy farming and cheese making. But I also cover coffee industry, chocolate, grains, and it, it becomes very interesting for me meshing all of those things together. So you have a ton of experience working across different types of food clusters. What does a food cluster mean to you and what excites you the most about them? So for me, food cluster is a uh, Apart from just being the, 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 the technical things that are cluster, the cluster of interrelated businesses that, that actually gain the, the, com, the, com, the competitive advantage from, from being uh, closely co-located, uh, co the test I always apply to, to, to clusters in food businesses is the test that I, I, I discovered in visiting uh, goat's milk cheese producers in France. And it is essentially, it is the PE teacher test or the, the coach test. I'm not quite sure what the appropriate terminology yep, would be for a US high school. So visiting these uh, producers in the Loire of wonderful, so Samo de Turenne, so the sort of the original ash goat's log, and watching them just nonchalant. They had their, their own animals that looked wonderful. They were nonchalantly sort of turning out the logs from the moles and they looked amazing. Every single progressive technique that you could use. In the US, they would be they would be felt to be sort of dangerously cutting edge and super, super, super hipster and really, really... It, and it, it just looked like they must have been doing this since time immemorial, that right. their families clearly must have learned from their great, 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 great grand parent who was taught to do it by God or something, <laughs> and uh, asking them, so, so how long has your family made cheese? Because these cheeses look amazing. And they turned around and they said, well, actually, uh, well, I, uh, until 10 years ago, I was a PE teacher at the local school and I just didn't fancy the life and we wanted to escape the rat race. And so we took a, we took a course at the local technical college and, and now we make cheese. And that, for me, is the definition of the capacity of a cluster, is to take, and I don't, I don't want, I don't, if, there, if anyone is a PE teacher out there, I certainly don't want them to come and beat me up, but to be able to take a PE teacher and turn them into these tremendously intuitive, uh, sensitive cheesemakers at home with their raw materials and with, a, with a, 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 a wonderful innate sense of how to process their milk. That's the power of a cluster. Is there a community of Graniacs in the UK? And if so, what, what does it look like? So I think the, the interesting thing about the UK grain community is possibly more so than the US. I think the UK is heavily scarred by the impact of the Chorley Wood process. And some of that, I think, has to do with World War II. That well, in, during World War II, high, because we were importing all of our high-protein wheat from Canada, there was a big government campaign. And there, there, there are some, if you get a chance to, 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 to watch them, there are some very compelling sort of government propaganda stroke information films where essentially it's every extra slice of toast you have, you're supporting Hitler. Uh, and Makes you not want so to have toast. <laughs> well, exactly. exactly. It, was, it, was, it was essentially, if you, if you 
you, if you if you love freedom, you eat potatoes. Right. And uh, so the interesting thing about the Chorley Wood process is this way to make essentially wonder bread through intensive mechanical kneading, very, very brief, very cursory fermentation, and getting a lot of the structure from uh, from, from hard fats, these days often palm oil. Uh, the interesting thing about, uh, about that is you can do it with the grains that we can, the wheat that we can grow in the UK. You can use very soft uh, wheat that will grow within the, the, the sort of temperate maritime, the Atlantic climate. Uh, of, of the United Kingdom and so that's become sort of the ubiquitous British loaf that is sliced bread and in as much as as there is a campaign I think there is a very interesting campaign that's moving people rediscovering sourdough rediscovering the handmade loaf and uh, even at, at, at the fringes I think rediscovering what British grains that we can grow and, and, and heritage grains, grains we have grown over history, taste like and what you, how you can process them and what sort of flavours you'll get. But, uh, but I think a lot of the conversation is specifically designed around the damage that these white sliced loaves have done to our bread culture. I, I grew up, I'm, I'm, I'm a product of that, I grew up until I was, until, until I was at university and buying my own food. I was... I was, was was eating white sliced bread essentially, or perhaps perhaps granary bread, or, or, or something that's essentially white sliced bread with a couple of inclusions. I, it was tremendous a tremendous impact on the, the British scene, and I think it's something that we're still trying to recover from. Do you have a favorite bread, and if what is what is that, and why? So the fav- my favorite bread for baking uh, actually started as a. And ultimately, I think not entirely successful attempt to rip off another baker's bread. So I very, very, very much enjoyed uh, Chad Robertson's Danish rye at Tartine Bakery in uh, San Francisco, and now at Tartine Manufactory, and and, and it was, was then at, at Bar Tartine. And this is before he has now published the actual official recipe of how they make it. Uh, whereas I ate it. In San Francisco, really, really enjoyed it. We then took a trip to Copenhagen. I ate very, some very similar breads, and I knew that it was made with sprouted rye. And then went home and sort of experimented. And it's very interesting for me now to see his official published recipe versus the sort of reverse engineered approach that I ended up devising. And they're they're not actually that closely related. I mean, they both produce a rye loaf in approximately the same dimensions but uh <laughs> they're, they're, they're both they're both interesting things for me to eat it's interesting. i think we uh because my wife works in the uh in the dairy industry she also runs a website microbialfoods.org so we are very much a, a fermentation based household and i think that i push as in as much fermentation as was physically possible and still have a, a loaf that held together so there was a little bit of pre-fermenting of the of the uh of rice but it, 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 it's great it tastes of miso and soy and these high umami flavors uh, towards the crust which i which i find tremendously uh, delicious but it, it is it is a failed attempt to rip off chad robertson <laughs> <laughs> understand is is a lot of uh, ways that people talk about um, wine and cheese specifically and I think bread is put into this category as well now is in terms of pairings are pairings useful ways to think about food and and if it is do you have a favorite bread wine I cheese pairing pairings are tremendously useful in terms of talking as a, as a way to capture the attention and capture the interest of marginally disengaged consumers of people who who want to eat something that's nice but who don't really who aren't interested in in in, in drawing back the veil and understanding all of this technical nitty-gritty yet right and the 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 challenge for everyone who's involved in any forms of these food or drink businesses is how do you convert is what a, a, as a, a good friend of mine who's a coffee roaster always says is that if you start something which is doing a serious, good incarnation of whatever industry it is, it is always going to be a significantly more significantly more expensive than the industrial version of it. Right. And if you're trying to get consumers, you're either going to have to create them 
or you're going to have to steal them from someone else. Mm -hmm. And if we as a group of people who are interested in these things don't want just to go around cannibalizing the, the, our, within, our, within our own bubble, if we want actually to grow our bubble, then pairings are a very, very useful tool just to start that very first conversation. So with, with uh, the, 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 the sprouted rye loaf that I was just talk, talk, uh, talking about, yeah. the interesting thing about that, because it's sprouted, it's, it doesn't have any sugar in it, but it tastes, has that wonderful sort of sweet grain, uh, grain sweetness to it. And, it. and it's dark and it tastes of miso, almost sort of miso, soy, umami sort of sets of flavors. It is a really compelling thing to serve with blue cheese. Right. So for us, Stilton or Stilton style blues, uh, there is a great heritage of, of, of British territorial blues. Uh, and then pairing that, with almost a self-consciously archaic pairing with something that is a, a wine that's fortified, a wine that's deliberately oxidized, perhaps a wine with a degree of residual sweetness. Uh, it, one, it's, it's a delicious thing to eat. And you, it, it, it's interesting, you serve these things and each individually, perhaps the consumer, they might have individually gone for some blue cheese because blue cheese is quite a mainstream thing. You can have your, your blue cheese dressing or whatever. Most, most people will all eat some blue cheese these odd dark rye loaves that sound like they're a little bit hippified and you've been talking for far too long about how they're fermented they're probably not so interested in those and they're certainly a little bit scared of these uh of of the madeira of the uh some palo cortado sherry of these these sorts of things that sound like things that your grandmother might have drunk with a vicar <laughs> and Putting them together as a pairing and then talking to them about how there are tremendous resonances with this about ideas about Britishness, about trying to find solutions to what do you drink, what do you grow, how do you process your food if you live in this temperate archipelago in the North Atlantic and you have great access to the sea but you're not really going to be growing very many grapes yourselves. Uh, and, and so and so there's a premium on wines that can be shipped and so that that means that things like, like fortification that deliberate oxidation become very useful ways that you can get the longevity in a pre-industrial environment to be able to get the wine to the UK right. uh, and that, that's a great way to start the start the discussion because the, the, mo the main thing that, that this, this this poor unsuspecting naive consumer is thinking is oh wow that tastes delicious and at the same time, it, it, it provides all of these nice little trigger entry points where we can start discussing some of the interesting things about what's what's the climate like where we live? How do, how does that affect our food system? How does how does how is the climate different in different places, and what how is that impacted the, the choices and the food systems there? Uh, whereas, yeah, we can we can conduct it as a very non-threatening conversation about pairings. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. We're heading into the, the Nini conference this year. Uh, our schedule just came out. You can check it out on our website. And I, I know you've had a chance to look it over, Francis. What's one workshop that you're that you're really excited about attending? So I'm actually going to cheat, cheat and say two. All right. There are. I'm lucky. I was lucky enough uh, when she was in London last month to uh, meet with and catch up with Stephanie Swain who is presenting i think on the on the on the future of bread and the the research and particularly the little sneak peek of the imaging uh and the, the, the photography from the sort of modernist cuisine bread book that uh she let me have a look at is utterly amazing and i think that's going to be very very interesting and very eye-opening for people in terms of understanding all those sorts of nagging questions that you've had but have never had the resources to do the imaging of the uh, gas development within your loaf. They have those resources. So I think that's going to be tremendously interesting. Uh, and then for me as someone who works a lot with, particularly with, with this, this cheese book on uh, pastoral farming, yeah. On, uh, on on dairy farming and one of the most interesting things about dairy farming is the move away from harvesting hay with a scythe to uh, 
mechanical harvesting, but also matched with, with, with the introduction of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers and the move away from hay, from dried grasses, to to uh, to to silage to 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 to, 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 and to fermented grasses as as, as the principal uh, winter forage for animals has been accompanied by a, or has caused a disastrous decline in field level biodiversity uh, on dairy farms and there is very interesting research that, that suggests that this is also matched by a decline in the uh, in in the interest in how interesting the, the, the flavours of the cheeses are, that, that more biodiversity gives you more interesting flavours to the cheese. So it's possible to have an entire, to have grazing, and you can have all the health benefits of grazing, but you could be using nitrogen aggressively and you could be essentially farming just a, geo, a geoculture. You could just be having uh, ryegrass and, 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 and red clover. Uh, so, so a grass legume thing, so you've got a bit of a nitrogen circle, cycle going on there. Uh, but you essentially have industrialised grazing. And so the session on the rise of the scythe, for me, is really, really interesting because haymaking was the single most manpower intensive stage of dairy farming up, up until, probably even up until well after the Second World War in the UK. In, in the US, I think it was mechanised a little bit earlier. But seeing what can be achieved there, what you can achieve with that uh, by doing things by hand, and what the market would look like if there was someone out there who did it by hand. How much would they have to charge for their cheese? How much would they have to charge for their bread? Would there be a tasteable difference that you could that you could offer the consumer, a, a, a story that they could detect in the loaf of the bread or the yeah. story they could detect in the slice of cheese? So for that, for me, that is from a professional perspective, that's going to be a really, really fascinating session. Thank you so much, Francis. I, we really appreciate it. We can't wait to see you this summer at the Needing Conference. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Was that, was that we okay, should take that, this show on the road. Yeah. <laughs> no, that